All right, colleagues. And as uh, some people are are still coming in, but we have a we have a packed agenda, so I'm I'm going to get started right away. And first to welcome you all to this launch event. This is also UNDP's, this is our first global consultation that we're hosting on Spark Blue this year. So we're very, very excited about that. This event is kicking it off. Uh, and the event is titled Bridging the Energy Divide. Um, we are going to hear from the Director and Assistant Secretary General for UNDP's Policy and Program Support Bureau, Marcos Neto, we will hear from the Vice President and Chief Impact Officer of IBM, Justina nixon Santo, And then we're gonna take a look with our colleagues at the work that we've been doing together over the past 18 months through IBM's Sustainability Accelerator, which has been a tremendous initiative and opportunity for us. And this was really important for us as well too, because there is some really important aspects of technology and expertise that we don't have uh, in UNDP. And this is where partnerships are so important. And in this case, partnerships with private private actors like IBM have been really tremendous for, for us. And so after we hear a little bit about what the products and the tools the, themselves are, we're gonna hear a little bit from two leaders from UNDP offices around the world who are gonna give us a sense of what's happening in their context. What are the challenges from an energy, energy perspective? What are the challenges also from a data perspective? And then hear a bit of a resonance and a reflection from them on these tools and approaches. We'll be closing with the head of the Sustainable Energy Hub. That's my colleague, Riyad Medeb. And we really want this to be the opening of a conversation. We hope this is energizing. We hope this gives you enough information. You'll know enough, and you'll also know where to find the rest of the consultation. Come in and tell us more. Uh, the most important thing for any of these tools and approaches and partnerships like this is that they are useful. Uh, and they really help us to make progress in understanding those that are most at risk of left behind, of being left behind. And we really are those biggest opportunities for us to make gains uh, towards a safe, towards a fair and an equitable energy transition. So with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Marcos Neto. Marcos, welcome again. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura. It's del delighted to be here with all of you. Um, let me start by thanking our partners in IBM, uh, Justine and all of her team, um, as well as, uh, you know, welcome our res reps uh, that are coming here and giving the valuable time to this important conversation, as well as Riyadh and all of the teams involved in this. Let me start with the good news. Global access to electricity grew an annual average rate of 0.7% between 2020 in 2021. The number of people without electricity almost halved during this period, dropping from 1.1 billion in 2012 to 700, 675 million in 2021, rising from 84% of the world's population to 91%. But the challenge to reach the full energy access are real, and we require an annual rate of growth in access of 1 percentage point through 2030. Uh, almost twice the current pace. To accelerate these, UNDP and the rest of the UN pledged to contribute it to provide access to clean and affordable and reliable energy for 500 million people and accelerate a just energy transition. This is one of our moonshots and is led by our sustainable energy hub uh, uh, that the Riyadh leads here. And there is a very strong data and a new technology component, which is the other side of this partnership with the SDG integration and through Laura's team with our partners in IBM. Because we need better information on those left behind. We'll help them to get the last mile of energy access for all. We need to know who has access and who doesn't. How sufficient is that access to accelerate the SDGs from clean cooking to better healthcare? This is especially critical for vulnerable communities creating jobs, lifting economic growth, opening opportunities for people to reach their full potential. This is why leaving no one behind is so important. Our transition to clean and affordable energy and needs a continuous spotlight with credible, meaningful evidence, national, regional, and global levels of our progress. Getting this right requires we think about energy access through the lenses of equity. The higher upfront cost of energy transition and potential job displacements are some of the areas of inequalities for energy transitions within countries. Globally, a recent study by Stanford University 
estimated the net present value of the capital cost to transition Africa while keeping the grid stable is 3.5 trillion US dollars, about 60% of the cost for Europe at 5.9 trillion. Our collaboration with IBM is moving the needle by focus on leaving the one behind and applying technology to generate information that supports micro and macro planning and informs investments and policies that help us achieve the SDGs. I'd like to close with thanks to IBM, especially to Justina Nixon sent IBM Vice President and Chief Impact Officer, whose team continued to work with not only UNDP and several organizations to help us advance the SDGs. Access to private sector technology is critical to solving complex development challenges. And we need organizations like IBM to continue to help us with that. Colleagues, to everyone joining us today, this is the beginning of a global consultation. So please visit our Spark Blue and join our 33,000 strong network so that your expertise and feedbacks makes our work better. I know I speak for you and the P and IBM that we are listening carefully through these consultations to your needs and your ideas and applications. You will see this show up in the final products. And I want to thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much. Have a great event, a great discussion later. Over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Marcos. Thanks for putting the, the emphasis so much on, on equity in access, leaving no one behind. And for those of you that perhaps are joining uh, through the collaboration or network which you hold with IBM, to also share that as UNDP, we operate in 170 countries and territories around the world. So this is a really critical initiative for us uh, across so many different types of country contexts uh, and needs. And that's why the global consultation that follows this is so important because there's a level of adaptation and tailoring that we will need in many different ways as we move forward with this agenda. And I know Riyadh will hear more from you on that in a moment. So let me introduce Justina, our next speaker, who is, there you are, Justina, who is the Vice President at IBM and Chief Impact Officer in leadership of this wonderful initiative of the Sustainability Accelerator, which we're very happy to be part, 18 months in now. Justina, thank you again for being here and over to you. All right, thank you, Marco, and thank you, Laura. And hello, everyone, and thanks so much for including me in this discussion. It is a pleasure to work with partners such as the United Nations Development Program and many other organizations that give us at IBM the opportunity to amplify our impact. I think I can confidently say today that technology is the key component to address many environmental related issues, including the energy divide. But more importantly, technology is the key to scale these solutions further and reach those that we cannot leave behind. Marco said it very well that this is really about making sure we are not leaving anyone behind and we are providing them with the solutions and the access to make sure that they're successful during this energy transition. At IBM, we have robust programs around sustainability founded on social and measurable impact and bolstered by our experts and our technology. Through our programs, we aim to address complex societal challenges which benefit stakeholders in many ways. We build programs that are closely aligned to IBM's core businesses in applying our strengths in technology to make sure we are having a meaningful impact in the communities we serve. Also, we target the most vulnerable populations because the changes that society is requesting come with that one condition that no one is left behind. And that's the reason we launched the IBM Sustainability Accelerator. This is a global pro bono social impact program that applies IBM technologies such as hybrid cloud and artificial intelligence and an ecosystem of experts to scale projects with nonprofit and government organizations. And the purpose of this is to help populations that are most at risk to environmental threats. The IBM Sustainability Accelerator has three main components. The first one is technology, the second one is partnerships, like the one we have with UNDP. And the third one is scalability. So I wanna start with the first one, technology. So IBM provides for two years, technology to help vulnerable populations and communities tackle environmental threats. Why do we do this over a course of two years? Because we really want this to work. And we want to make sure we put in the time and effort that is required 
to make these solutions sustainable. Second, partnerships. I am a believer in partnerships because corporations, governments, and civil society organizations cannot do this alone. You need partners to scale your work. You need partners with the right expertise to add value to your portfolio. And you need partners that really understand what these communities want and look for. And most importantly, you need partners that have the right expertise to execute these projects. And third, by bringing together technology and partners, what you get is scalable solutions. Solutions that can be implemented all across the world, helping populations from different backgrounds and cultures. Our programs work with UNDP is a great example of these types of fruitful partnerships, as you will see in today's discussion. I really hope you enjoy learning more about how we are working with UNDP, how we are using artificial intelligence and geospatial analytics to increase universal access to clean energy, and how we are all working hard to leave no one behind. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to the upcoming discussions. Thank you, Laura. Back to you. Thank you so much, Justina. And let's dive in, colleagues. So I'm going to invite Babatunde Abadoy, who is the policy advisor for UNDP, uh, together with Rob. Well, I will lost your voice, but uh... <laughs> over to you. Thank you very much, Lara, and uh, thanks, uh, Marcos and Justina, uh, for that intro. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm very glad that we're here um, at this time to be able to share the work that we've been doing and analytics uh, to support energy uh, working globally. Uh, can you put on the slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so, the you know, as we've heard, there's a, there's a lot that needs to be done in order for us here to achieve that 500 million people uh, to get access to energy. Right? And uh, a big part of that uh, can be summarized into these three points. Right? First, uh, we need to be able to understand uh, those that will be left behind, uh, who doesn't have access uh, currently. And here we're noting reliable access, right? And where are they? Uh, and also, we needed to understand uh, vulnerable households uh, that can, in terms of uh, willingness to pay, uh, the case for private and public uh, investment for access. And lastly, uh, it's very important uh, to make a case for impact of this energy access. So what happens, what's the cost benefit analysis of investing a dollar uh, in affordable, reliable energy? an impact on different development outcomes. Um, so in terms of poverty alleviation, in terms of uh, uh, health and the rest. Uh, so those are the main three areas where we started to think through in terms of analytics that can help us uh, with that. Uh, next slide. And in order to, to the first one, uh, we worked with University of Michigan um, uh, at, uh, with Brian and the team uh, to be able to map out the access uh, for a lot of countries. We have more than 100 countries uh, that are mapped out and it can be able to go to the link uh, that we'll put in the chat uh, for, leaks, for colleagues here to have a look at that, uh, where you can look at your country. Uh, you can be able to see how many people have access and this is using AI and satellite images uh, to be able to understand uh, who has access. Uh, this, uh, we have data up to 2020, 2021 um, and then uh, you can be able to overlay that with other indicators, right? On uh, the next slide, uh, which uh, using, you know, combining that with data on poverty, combining that with data on uh, willingness to pay and uh, income and the rest, uh, which helps us to, to analyze our vulnerability uh, in different ways. The third part, uh, next slide, is now the analysis, the work that we did with the University of uh, Denver at the Party Center, where we took the, you know, information and electricity access uh, and uh, it kind of investment of, you know, what happens if all these people are, gets access to electricity. And that work helps us to, to unpack, you know, millions of people that will get, uh, that we put out of poverty uh, with views of uh, our work on the SDG push, uh, a lot of gains in terms of clean cooking and infections and, dis uh, and diseases, um, and also uh, GDP gain, right? Uh, so this is some of the work that we've done so far uh, in this area. Uh, next slide. And 
all of this helps us to be able to build a strategic coalition uh, with government, uh, for us to be able to pull in private sector, uh, for us to also understand and, uh, who is going to be left behind and also make a case for financing uh, support. Uh, next slide. But we know, uh, given all of this work that has been done so far, that it wasn't sufficient, right? Uh, there's a lag in data access, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have data up to 2021. Uh, we need uh, recent data, but most importantly, also the, uh, some level of forecast into the future to you to understand uh, that better. Uh, it was, it's also very, very important to think through a just and fair transition, right? So there's a lot of conversation around energy transition, and how do we make sure that this is a just and fair transition? Uh, and then all of this requires partnership, all of this requires innovative and strategic approaches. Uh, this is where you know, we had to work with uh, IBM uh, in order to, to start to unpack this and see how we can explore some of this uh, information. And now I'll uh, hand over to Rob uh, to take us through what we've been done, doing so far with IBM. Over to you, Rob. Excellent. Thanks so much, Fabatunde. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. And just one more, please. And then uh, just loop through one, two, three, just one more. Perfect. Okay. So um, I think um, in terms of the, the work that uh, we've been doing with UNDP, we, we sort of grouped it into four different work streams. And uh, if, look, if you start at the bottom level, um, that's essentially the, the, the main platform that we're working with, which is the GeoHub platform that you saw uh, that Baba Tunde was sharing earlier. Uh, so this is really the centralized uh, geospatial repository for all of the data and models uh, that we're building as part of this uh, project. And there's there's two main sort of uh, modeling work streams that we're, we're focusing on here. Uh, the first is on forecasting electricity access, right? So um, it, it's one thing to understand current state access, but how do we project that using uh, geospatial data, other demographical data. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty large problem that, uh, you know, IBM uh, in conjunction with UNDP, as well as a few other partners have taken on. Um, so that's sort of the, the first piece, and I'll share a few slides that sort of what that looks like in terms of the modeling. Um, the, the next piece is, okay, that's sort of the, in an ideal world setting, um, you know, where we could expect people to have access uh, forecasting that out. But there's a big component that's sort of not being looked at in terms of the equity piece, right? Just because there is a potential for people to have electricity in certain areas, do they have the means to acquire that energy, whether it be financial or other social factors? So this is where we've built what we call the Clean Energy Equity Index, or CEI, uh, in conjunction and in partnering with Stony Brook University in New York. And the, the last piece up top is really on how do we... Uh, make sure what we're building is accommodating and factoring in uh, a climate climate change, right? So in particular, yes, we know the planet's getting warmer and we're experiencing more extreme uh, severe weather events, but how does it impact things like renewable energy, right? So we've done some initial research that says, hey, it may not be as sunny or windy in certain parts of the world, which would of course impact things like wind and solar uh, power. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so just kind of going a step further in terms of the electricity forecasting work stream. Um, so what the approach that we're taking, uh, it's something called cellular automata. Uh, and it actually kind of roots to um, sort of biology, right, in terms of actually predicting things like diseases with respect to basically representing, uh, you know, points or, or cells uh, and applying rules to those particular cells. So in the case for forecasting electricity, uh, a big component of this is the data set that uh, the opportunity shared uh, from the University of Michigan, the HARIA data, the high resolution energy access data. And that's basically looking at, basically look, bringing in multiple different satellites and looking at the, the visible and nighttime uh, imagery re reflecting back in terms of, hey, there's uh, more or less light in certain areas. And then we're also bringing other data sets that help us look at uh, things like land use, um, uh, demographics, uh, things run like lakes, uh, distance to roads, basically factors that we can look at, hey, uh, what's the probability of you know, someone perhaps having electricity uh, 
projecting that over time. So you see here on the table, these are just, uh, you know, an overview of sort of the rules that we apply uh, in certain certain scenarios. Uh, the covariance is sort of where we then apply, um, you know, what we call a light score, right? So based on the rules that we apply, uh, it's a binary yes or no in terms of the next year, does this cell uh, have electricity or not? Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? We, um, oh, sorry, this is the uh, the data sets that I mentioned. So I mentioned Haria, sort of that, the, the, the satellite, nighttime uh, satellite imagery, land use, uh, digital elevation map, DEM, uh, roads, and so forth. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so where we've done this before, um, the, the initial uh, test areas you see here are mapped. Uh, we have uh, done work in Kenya, Peru, Malawi, and also Madagascar. And the current work that we're doing now is actually scaling out to the country level uh, and globally as well. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see an example where uh, we essentially have a forecast for uh, Kisumu in, in Kenya, uh, which is the, I believe, the third uh, largest city in Kenya. Uh, population of about 600,000. And you see our forecast here going from 2013 uh, out, out to uh, 2030. Uh, each of these uh, cells or, or grid blocks here in orange are essentially signaling uh, access to or potential for electricity. Uh, and you see over time, you see more of these grid cells start populating, showing our forecast uh, of the spread of electricity uh, in this particular area. Um, and this is just one example uh, of sort of how we brought together all these data sets and are start applying the forecasting piece of that. Uh, so that's a real quick uh, sort of deep dive on the electricity forecasting layer. Uh, to go to the next slide, please. We're going to switch over to and just hit one more, please. Um, perfect. Uh, so now we're going to go into the Clean Energy Equity Index or the CEI. So as I mentioned, this is a great partnership that we have with Sony Burke University, uh, really to assess you know three things, right? Uh, looking at access to renewable energy, access to affordable energy, and also looking at increasing the transparency to how energy decisions are made uh, in terms of policies. Um, and, you know, the idea here is really to look at, you know, what communities have made progress towards their clean energy goals and, and which have not. And, you know, those who have not really to focus on more data driven uh, tools that allow us to look at, you know, well, why, why is that, right? So looking at more of a a multi-dimensional view of, you know, not just one particular layer, but being able to look at multiple indicators, which I'll talk about on the next slide. If you go uh, next one, please. Um, and actually just one more, please. Um, so these are sort of the three um, pillars that we're focusing on the construction of this uh, Clean Energy Equity Index framework. Uh, so the first is on the potential. So this is a lot of the sort of the, the forecasting uh, component here on the potential, right? So uh, looking at the potential for solar power as well as wind power. Uh, the next one in terms of this middle category is really on the means and resources, right? So, uh, you know, do people have, you know, the capital to uh, obtain that energy? Uh, looking at things like grid infrastructure, right? You know, yes, there could be uh, potential for, say, renewables, but is there other infrastructure such as energy transmission to carry that power to populations that require it, as well as other more social aspects. So looking at things like uh, jobs in the renewable energy sector, education, and also that access piece. Uh, and the third area is around urgency, right? So uh, looking at things like uh, GHG emissions um, from the environmental perspective, looking at uh, share fossil fuels, uh, this could be looking at sort of other kind of renewable uh, specific goals for particular areas. Uh, and these are sort of the, the, the three areas that we focus the index on. If you go to the next slide, we'll show you sort of what this looks like for a quick demo. And um, I'll let this loop through if you just maybe click play on this video or maybe just click advance one more to start. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I forgot to mention the, the construction of this index, actually we used New York State as the initial test bed. Um, just given sort of the availability of some of these data sets. And now we've quickly shifted towards building out this global index. So we focus here on, this is actually uh, an example of the global index centered over uh, Africa in GeoHub. And you see us looping through a couple of the indicators there. You saw urgency, we just flipped on before. This is on potential uh, to energy. Um, all of these sort of filters are customizable based on the, the color palettes, as well as the, um, the ranges. 
Um, so you can see here, we're just zooming into a couple of different areas. Um, all the data, if we zoom into a certain area, we're able to see all the, the individual indicators uh, that start popping up here. Um, so we'll zoom into a particular area here and we'll select a particular uh, settlement area. There we go. And you can see all of the, um, the indicators that were um, part of this initial uh, global index here, filtered here as well. Uh, so just a, a quick taste of sort of what this looks like. Uh, this is uh, available right now within GeoHub for, for folks to experiment with. Um, where we are with the project right now is essentially uh, scaling this out uh, across all of the countries. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, great. And then the last component that, that that top layer that I mentioned really is okay. We know uh, we know the forecasting piece, we know the equity piece, uh, but again, how do we ensure that both the access and forecasting piece are uh, you know aligned to a changing climate? Um, so this is a couple of samples where we've essentially took a lot of large um, we call it GCM global climate models, um, which are basically uh, you know, future projections out to about 100 years or so, looking at things, uh, you know, beyond the typical parameters, right? Again, most of the focus on a lot of these insights are, you know, temperature projections and precipitation. But what we did further was looking at variables that we care about with respect to clean energy, right? So looking at things like solar radiance for predictions around solar power, and then of course, wind speed and wind direction for wind power. Uh, and these are just a couple of the, of the example uh, insights that we saw. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, data engineering that goes behind this in terms of, you know, these very, very large, uh, complex data sets, the bias correction piece. Um, there's also some downscaling, right? So all these climate models are at very coarse resolution. So downscaling to certain areas, uh, communities, you know, below this country level to get uh, much more targeted insights. And then if you go to the next slide, we'll, we'll loop through an example of the essentially climate risk um, uh, kind of pilot that we did. Um, and you know, we're showing this within GeoHub. Uh, we've done this in two areas, um, Senegal, which I believe is the first one that will pop up here. Yep. Um, so we're looking at the first one that's gonna be showing up is looking at the change in solar radiation under the SSP uh, 2.45 scenario. Um, so we'll zoom in here. Um, this is for the period 2036 to 2045. The, the darker oranges there show um, essentially a decrease in solar radiation for that time period. And we could also look at other scenario periods. We could look at uh, other different emissions um, scenarios such as SSP uh, uh, 585. And then we also did this in Kenya. Uh, again, the darker red shades there you see are corresponding to the larger decreases uh, in solar radiation, all of the kind of filtering color palettes, a lot of the aggregation methods, you could all do that natively within GeoHub. And now we're looking at an example for the change in, in wind speed uh, over that same period there, um, both in Senegal, then we'll look over to, um, to Kenya as well. Uh, and then we also did it for the period, longer term period from 2076 to 2085. Um, so again, and then we'll also look through more sort of um, deprivation kind of use cases, right? So the combination of say, you know, a, a reduction in wind speed and say maybe a reduction in solar, obviously are much more priority in terms of, hey, uh, you know, this may be indicators that we need to look at maybe um, investing more in renewables to accommodate that loss in renewables or, Primarily looking at, hey, do I need to um, perhaps invest more in battery or storage technologies to accommodate that perhaps potential loss in renewable generation? Uh, so a lot more to come here, but this is one piece that uh, is sort of the icing on the cake uh, as we round out the forecasting and access component there. So I'll stop there. A lot, to, a lot to look at here. You know, we are in the consultation period where folks can can look at and and, and play around with some of these data sets. But I'll, I'll turn it back to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Lara. Lara, you good? Try and talk. Riyad will come in for for the yeah. second half. Rob and Babatuni both. Thank you very much.
colleagues, as Riyadh is, is coming in, uh, let me also just remind, please do ask questions in the chat. We'll put together a, a list of all of the questions and respond to them also in our Spark Blue consultation space. Uh, and many of the colleagues who are answering your questions right now are the moderators, several across UNDP and IBM who will be working over the next couple of weeks uh, together with you. So they're on the call. I appreciate really they're already jumping in with questions and answers, and we really want to keep this live and dynamic. Riyadh, uh, Absolutely. You're Thank you very okay. much, Laura. Thank you also, Babatunde and uh, Rob. What was very an excellent presentation, and you've seen the different example where we were able, what we were able to advance. Well, now we're moving to another level of the work is the implementation on the ground. And uh, I am very happy that we are joined by two of my uh, close friends. First of all, uh, Natasha Van Hoon, who is our UNDP resident representative in Madagascar. And of course, uh, Sneha Soneji from uh, our Comoros country uh, office. Uh, yeah. Dear colleagues, I have uh, a first round of questions uh, to both of you. First, Natasha, can you please tell us about uh, your country reality on energy access and equitable transition, and what are the challenges and uh, opportunities? Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, it's very much a pleasure for me to be joining this call uh, all the way from a place called Tuamasana on the eastern coast of Madagascar. Um, to be participating, not only learning more about uh, this great collaboration, but also to share a little bit about the realities here in Madagascar. In Madagascar. So uh, I'm sure that many of you, when you think of Madagascar, uh, think of many different things, uh, beautiful beaches, luscious tropical vegetation, incredible biodiversity, and perhaps even vanilla, and all of those things are true. Uh, what is also true is that Madagascar is a least developed country and its current electricity access rate is at 35.1%. In rural areas of the island, uh, it's as low as 10.9%. And in urban areas, it's at 72, an estimated 72%. That already tells you a lot about the levels of inequality across the island. It's an island of 33 million people. Um, and the main source of electricity here is 50% uh, or 53% fossil fuel and 39% hydropower. In terms of end use energy consumption, uh, in terms of source, the majority of the island is using biofuels, in other words, um, uh, forest and wood uh, to, to burn and cook. This is uh, of incredible concern on an island like Madagascar, known for its very, very rich biodiversity. And so there are many, many opportunities in terms of um, what needs to be done. Uh, with So maybe let me stop there for the, for the first uh, question, Riyadh, and uh, I'm available for the next one Thank if there you. is. Thank you, Natasha. On your side, uh, Snehal, how do you see the case of... Uh my beautiful country, Comoros. You are muted, Snehal. It's Thank AI you so who is blocking you, like they blocked me before. To you. Thank you so much, Thank you so much uh, Riyadh, and thank you, colleagues, for this opportunity. I also uh, um, uh, agree with everything that uh, Natasha said with regards to being able to participate in this conversation. So, uh, Riyadh, I think uh, uh, when it comes to Comoros, uh, you know, there are uh, there are about 130 participants in this uh, particular call. And if I were to take a uh, actually an honest poll, I am not sure many people will be able to place uh, on a map uh, where exactly Comoros is. Uh, so, uh, so, and that's that's not that's not uh, surprising because we are a small country. We are. Uh, a country in the uh, Mozambique Channel. Uh, we are a country of four islands, of which uh, UNDP operates in three islands, and then uh, a population of about 850,000 people uh, and a total um, area of about 2,000 square kilometers. Um, what makes Comoros unique uh, is the fact that uh, no, the, there is this dispersed population, and also we are on an active, uh, the, the largest island is actually based around an active volcano. So on one hand, 
there is this huge potential of trying to exploit this uh, this great source of uh, energy, the geothermal energy that exists. But on the other hand, the entire uh, needs of the island, energy needs of the island are uh, almost the entire energy needs of the islands are uh, met by through diesel uh, powered uh, generators. Uh, indeed, there is um, some solar, but the problem with that is that it does not provide the, it is not basically providing the base energy needed so as to be able to supply uh, to all uh, the or supply all the needs of the country. What is unique about Comoros is the fact that uh, the it is an, it, almost more than 80% of the total households are connected to the grid. However, this is the grid is really old and rickety. Uh, there isn't, uh, and also there isn't enough power uh, that is produced to be able to sort of provide uh, power to, uh, to all these households. Plus, there are also the regular things about the fact that it's a poor country, the fact that it is uh, also... Uh, um, a corrupt country, therefore, uh, the distribution is uh, done by the uh, uh, government uh, entity, which therefore means a lot of losses, uh, a huge amount of money is invested by the government, which is actually uh, not uh, has not many sources of revenue uh, to subsidize uh, the production and distribution of energy. And therefore, we are very much in an unsustainable uh, situation when it comes to uh, the uh, the the uh, the uh, provision of energy and this is why uh, there exists an opportunity to exploit uh, the renewable source of energy that that can exist and it includes everything from geothermal energy to wind and to solar. Thank thank you very much, uh, Snehal, and the importance in your country of the geothermal here in terms of access and for the future that respond really to uh, what is uh, important is the equitable transition. Uh, in terms of second question, um, uh, Natasha, how can the application of technologies, such as uh, our collaboration now with the uh, IBM uh, presented by the, its vice president, empower, do you think will empower communities and policymakers to accelerate progress towards sustainable energy for all, and particularly in underserved areas, in Madagascar. Thank you very much, Riyad, for the question. And in fact, um, I actually see a, a huge amount of potential in translating the existing collaboration into a context like the Malagasy one. And we've seen already that uh, the region of Ansinana uh, of Madagascar is already featuring in some of the work that was presented earlier. But uh, basically, um, what Madagascar is, is has similarities to Comoros uh, right next door in the sense that we have an island which next to the continent uh, doesn't look like a big one, but actually um, the, ex the space expands quite quickly when we think about the question of access. Firstly, physical access. There are very little roads outside of the capital, Tana, that render access possible. For an example, um, I'm here in Toamasana, which is on the Eastern coast. Uh, colleagues took 12 hours driving 400 kilometers to get here yesterday, um, which gives you an example of what a 40 minute flight translates into when you start getting into the terrain and the reality on the ground. The same question on access poses itself when it comes to electricity. So there's a very, very uneven distribution. There are populations and pockets of populations in very remote areas of the country. And so what the work that is being done um, renders possible is the fact to actually accurately map uh, the areas and the regions that have um, very severe uh, poor access in terms of leaving no one behind to potentially identify the areas next to them with um, potential for different kinds of infrastructure in order to build, um, whether it's solar, wind or, or other kinds of power to ensure that uh, there is a distribution. And therefore, again, coming back to leaving no one behind, that there's a more equitable access across geography. Once again, it's very uneven. So 
geospatial technology, such as the maps that we were seeing earlier, would re really render uh, the question of equity um, a possible, a much more uh, granular conversation around equity possible in a place like Madagascar. We could also start talking much more about which kinds of power where solar, wind, hydro, uh, by having that data and ensuring that decisions can be made um, based on a really accurate understanding of what is possible where and who is where also. Thank you very much, Natasha. Uh, on your side, uh, Sneha, knowing that there are a lot of analysis were done in Madagascar to identify, in uh, Comoros, to identify the potential of wind, the, the potential of geothermal. How do you see this approach and this collaboration of IBM reaching to those, uh, the one who are left behind? Especially you mentioned from the beginning that only 30% of uh, the population is connected to the grid. So, uh, Sneha. So, uh, so no, these tools are uh, super uh, exciting and super useful from where I sit. Um, because you see, one of the massive problems that we have here is actually lack of data. Uh, what that uh, prevents, uh, proper, and as you can imagine, this actually prevents uh, sensible policy making. And uh, the, one of the ways of trying to collect this data would be to, in the old days to actually go house, house to house and to do this. And if there is a way, uh, by one of by using one of these tools that was presented here to try and look at what is actually uh, the access that people have uh, to electricity uh, using AI and these tools that they were referred to, um, then that would already give you a, a big, huge step forward in terms of how policy can win. And I actually really like the point that uh, Natasha made because this would therefore, which was around the fact that what kind of power where, which is also basically something that would allow uh, this solution to be tailored to what uh, uh, the specific needs of uh, different populations are. And I also wanted to point out, unlike uh, many countries in on, on the African yeah. continent, which are, con which are contiguous and which are large, we have a specific challenge because we are on three different islands. And, you know, uh, just as a concrete example, even if geothermal there, uh, if tomorrow there was a way, the from where I am sitting, the the uh, uh, volcano is on the other uh, side, and if we were to be able to put together a plant that starts producing electricity tomorrow, the issue is going to be: is it going to be viable to be able to transport this electricity that is going to be produced to the neighboring islands? Because you know the distance which is there between where the electricity is going to be produced to the point to where the other islands are is about 100 kilometers. Um, so there is this whole uh, question of, therefore, would this, e uh, th therefore, this question of equity comes in across islands, but also within islands. Uh, and how can this exploitation take, can take place? One more thing that I wanted to say is, uh, you know, the second largest island out of the four here in Comoros is called Anjuan. It has one of the, it is one of the largest, uh, highest density of population uh, in uh, as, as far as islands go in the world. So uh, when you're talking of trying to provide the solar uh, panels or solar based uh, um, renewable energy solutions, that's also a question because there isn't enough land where we can actually put in these panels and there is severe pressure on land. I can give you a totally anecdotal, but a, 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 data, point, a data point which is actually uh, gives you a sense of how precious and how much pressure that exists on land. Actually, 90% uh, of the total uh, uh, legal uh, cases that you see in the system of Comoros are actually linked to land. So that already tells you how much pressure there is on the land and how that therefore then impacts uh, equity and access. And therefore, going back to this point of which allows therefore this, these tools that we're talking about will allow us to basically try and answer this question of what kind of energy and where and at what cost. Last point, you see, uh, Robert talked about climate risk. You know, as a as a as a as a small island development state, one this is also going to be one of the key issues that's going to impact us. If you look at a map of uh, all the three islands, you will see that most of the population is actually around the uh, volcano and actually on the on, on the on the coast. So if there is going to be a sea level rise, how is that going to impact uh, both? 
the generation of electricity and uh, and and also uh, how is it going to impact the distribution and what kind of technologies do you use to be able to uh, provide uh, a sustainable source of energy to all the population not only for domestic use but also other productive uses and this is where solutions like the africa minigrid program which we are in the process of implementing can use some of this data to try and pro provide these solutions at scale it's yeah. excellent, uh, Snehal. Really, it uh, you, you and Natasha, you 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 have identified the specificity of uh, living on a big island or in archipelago and the uh, sea rising uh, impact on infrastructure. And that's why the kind of uh, tools that develop uh, in cooperation with IBM are useful. Are useful, uh, one, to identify where we could have this kind of problem, and second, to on the weather forecast which can have an impact on the reality, on daily reality of your island. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, uh, in this session, we would like you to have a chat, uh, to ask questions on the chat, but also to prepare yourself for uh, this discussion that we're gonna have on uh, Spark Blue. I would like to go directly to the main conclusion. And, uh, and I would like, first of all, uh, to, we have listened to our director of BPPS, Marcos Neto, as he highlighted how achieving universal access to reliable, affordable, and sustainable electricity demands a significant emphasis on innovation. And it is not only about identifying last mile solution, but also about developing data-driven policies and projects to realize our ambitious goals. I agree with Marcos. We are on a trajectory of a rapid growth and the pathway to clean, affordable and reliable energy is gradually emerging. Yet for this growth to benefit all, it needs to be accessed by all on a fairer terms. And we have also listened to uh, Madam Justina nixon Stains, Vice President of the Chief Impact Officer at IBM, our good partners, on how they are deploying cutting edge innov innovative solutions to help guide decisions makers and how to respond to energy demand challenges. I agree also with you, Justina. Applying geospatial data and artificial intelligence will make it easier to pinpoint to a greater degree of accuracy where electricity is lacking and where electricity is needed most and where there is an oversupply. It is crucial also to recall the insights shared by Natasha and Snehal just right now, from Comoros and Madagascar. Their perspective shed lights on the challenges and opportunities these countries face in improving energy access and, promote, and promoting equitable transition. This reinforced the added value of leveraging the latest technology from the private sector with UNDP strategic policy work. The colleagues now at UNDP, our systemic approach on energy development strive to ensure that Clean renewable energy access aligns with key societal aspects like public service provision, rural uh, livelihood, and eradication of poverty, promoting an inclusive and sustainable transformation of the energy landscape, and reaching even those left behind. These data initiatives launched today mark significant momentum toward these goals. As discussed by all our esteemed panelists throughout this webinar, this type of data products are essential to visualize various scenarios, facilitate investment decision, and shape appropriate legislation and policies of distributed energy generation. However, it is crucial to move beyond developing data product alone and focus on the tangible benefits for developing countries. Several challenges remain to address in order to this solution to be effective in a developing countries like the one of Madagascar or Comoros. Energy modeling tools are already well integrated into policy making and planning globally, including multiple open source modeling tools and that can account for variable, including market dynamic and energy supply and demand. However, most of this model are still in the very early stages of integrating development dimensions beyond market dynamic and need further advancement to properly account for social and economic factors that characterize energy system in developing regions. And this include urban rural disparities, like in the island uh, cases, informal emerging market, economic transition, and accounting for data gaps. 
As development agency, we must always recognize that energy systems operate within broader socioeconomic context. Therefore, we must integrate appropriate social and development variable into our modeling and forecasting initiatives. In the design phase of any innovation, we must prioritize elements that focus on actionable data and indicators, thereby facilitating tangible and equitable transformation in the energy system worldwide. What are our next steps, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen? Allow me to now reflect on the next steps. Here at UNDP, we are always reflecting on how to leverage technology data to achieve inclusivity in electricity access, like presented by my friend Baba Tunde. Your views, feedback, and comment are important as we embark on the online discussion that officially start today. Over the coming four weeks, we will have a public consultation exercise where we would like to hear from you. We hope to, read, to hear from the broader community about the usefulness and relevance of these tools for different contexts. One, however, uh, you are addressing inequity in energy transition goals and ambition in your context. What are the information, data, tools do you use to understand energy access gaps and inequities in the energy transition in our world. Third, what recommendation do you have for tailoring these tools developed through this partnership to better suit energy access and energy transition goal in our context? Like Justina mentioned, we want to see result on the ground. This big investment done by IBM is to see the result on the ground. And how can this tool develop, be enhanced to, the, to provide improved support for your work. This and many more are welcome during this public consultation. Remember, there is no right or wrong answers, just collective intelligence that we will strengthen our tools for sustainable energy access. Our team of moderator is on hand to guide you and as we count on you for your support. After the consultation of our, uh, our technical teams at uh, UNDP SDGI, Sustainable Energy Hub, IBM, and Stony Brook will ensure that this feedback is incorporated to make these tools more purposeful for supporting micro planning on electricity access and equitable energy transition. I now take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today and look forward to your active participation in our online consultation process. Goodbye, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you.